Happy Lord's Day, my dear brethren. Good morning for everybody. First of all, we would like to thank the Lord for another opportunity that He given us that um, we have this life and uh, we have our voices to sing praises to Him. And as I always say, every morning is a blessing to the Lord. So this morning, we will uh, um, go ahead and continue with uh, what I've started last, um, last Sunday with the book of uh, John chapter 15. And uh, we will be talking this morning, we'll be talking about the consequence of unfruitfulness. Now, being a uh, disciple of Christ, being a servant of the Lord, it is not without any responsibilities, right? Um, it is the same when uh, we are doing our secular work or even when we join any organization for that matter. There are responsibilities. There are work to be done. And there are expectations uh, from us that we need to deliver, right? And uh, the same thing, when you surrender your life to Jesus, we took an oath, an oath of a lifetime servitude to him. And um, with that comes work, with that comes expectations from you, from all of us. And again, there is work to be done. And in John chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus tells us emphatically, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. So it is for God's glory, the Father's glory, that we bear much fruit. Remember last week, we uh, mentioned that the vine dressers, the Father, and um, he is in charge of all the, uh, the vineyard. You know, when the, when the grape vine produces fruit, it is the vine dresser who is first to be, to be happy because he sees the, his fruit, the labor of his, uh, the fruit of his labor. And uh, when we bear much fruit, it is the vine dresser, the father, that uh, be glorified. This is to my father's glory. So the father is glorified. And as part of the vine, as all we are all believers, what does the Lord require of his disciples? The father is glorified when we bear much fruit. But the question is, what does the Lord require of his disciples? Well, of course, number one is we must bear much fruit. That's the number one. And the next question would be, what are those fruits? What are the fruits? First and foremost is, since Jesus Christ was talking to his disciples, believers already, of course, Jesus Christ wants the fruit of their faith. And the fruit of their faith is obedience. And Jesus Christ is also asking that from us. Our faith, the fruit of our faith must be that of obedience to him. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Jesus is telling us to obey. To be obedient to him. And in James chapter 1 verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Be doers of the word. Obedience to God. The fruit of your faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. The number two fruit is the fruit of the spirit. Since you and I, we are now believers in the Lord, we have 
the Holy Spirit in us. And with that, the fruit of the Spirit is our character, our whole being. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, but the Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law that says these things are wrong. So meaning, by obedience, we are living the gospel. By obedience, we embody a Christ-centered life. So therefore, our character must be that of what Christ would love us to be and would like us to be. And according to Galatians 5, 22, 23, those are the fruit of the Spirit. The third fruit, being believers of the Lord, we are commanded to witness for Him. And the fruit of our witness is actually soul winning. We must win souls for the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, even though I am free man, I am a free man with no master. I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Paul admittedly that he is a slave to Christ. His master is Jesus Christ. And therefore, as, as being a slave to Jesus Christ, he needs to bring people to Christ. He needs to win souls for the Lord. And in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The fruit of the righteous. If you are a true believer of the Lord, you will live a righteous life. And as such, being or living a righteous life, there is therefore a, uh, a, uh, a heaven. There is therefore a reward, heaven that awaits us, the tree of life. And therefore, having that reward, having that wonderful reward that awaits us all in heaven, it is paramount that we must also share that kind of reward to other people. That's why it says, and he that winneth souls is wise. If you have a good message, if you have a wonderful message in you, you must share that message. And in our hands is the message of God, the message that brings salvation unto man. And we must therefore share that message because that message will bring us the tree of life. And of course, we want others to have the tree of life as well. If you're one, of the, one of your family members is not yet saved, do not have yet Jesus Christ, share the gospel so that that person may also have the tree of life. And he that with his souls is wise. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, Paul said, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. So there is a mandate for all of us. The fruit of our witnessing is we must deliver the gospel in order for us to win souls. How can we win souls if we will not deliver the gospel? Winning souls is by delivering the gospel or by witnessing for Christ. Witnessing for Christ means your own personal testimony. You give your testimony to other people. Why, in the first place, you accept the Lord? Why, in the first place, you are a Christian? You testify that. You witness that to other people as to why you are now a Christian. As to why every Sunday, every meeting of believers, you are there. Why? There, should, there must be a good reason why. And you must witness that to other people so that they too can have the same tree of life, the same heaven that you are waiting 
so that they too can be saved. So we must witness, we must win souls for the Lord. Though I have listed down uh, three foots of discipleships, there are actually, with those three, there are actually two fruits of discipleship. We can classify them in, in, in two. And this, the fruit of discipleship, number one is fruit of Christian character. That is the fruit of faith, obedience, the fruit of spirit, character, and number two, the fruit of witnessing, soul winning. So the fruit of discipleship is about your character. What you become when you have Jesus in your life. That's your character. And the number two fruit of discipleship is soul winning. The, the uh, uh, great commission that was given to us by the Lord. And we will be discussing this uh, in the following weeks to come. Now, there must be a re prerequisite in order for you and I to bear fruits. There must be a prerequisite. And what is the prerequisite? Remain in me. In John chapter 15, verse 4, part of our scripture reading, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, it remains in me, in Jesus Christ. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So the prerequisite for you and I to bear all those fruits is we must remain in Jesus Christ. Remain in the vine. Continuously attached to Jesus. Now remaining in the vine, remaining in Jesus, it means Jesus is the life source. Jesus is your life giver. Now, if we do not remain in the vine, if we do not remain in Jesus Christ, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of <clears throat> unfruitfulness if we do not remain in Jesus or if we fall away or if we backslide? Now, I want you to take note again that Jesus was talking to his disciples. They were they were already in Jesus. They were already believers. And as such, they were already saved. Therefore, those who are not in Jesus Christ in the first place cannot be any more detached from him because they were never attached to him at all. Now, here are the consequences of those believers who gave up and separated themselves from Jesus Christ. Well, of course, number one, when you are, are not attached to the vine, you will bear no fruit. That's the number one consequence. You will bear no fruit. And therefore, you don't have the Christian character in you. Because you detach yourself from the Lord, you do not have Christ in you, you do not have that Christian character that we read a while ago in Galatians chapter 5. Now, you don't have also that wonderful privilege of witnessing to others about Jesus Christ. You don't have that privilege because you don't have Jesus Christ. It means you are living in the opposite side of Christianity. <clears throat> now, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are not bearing fruits. They detach themselves from Jesus Christ and therefore they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you might not have all of them, a person might not have all of them, but definitely and for sure, you are living some of them. If we detach ourselves with Jesus Christ, 
I'm pretty sure that we will have some of those that listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Now, if we are going to survey why people are hesitant to give their life to Jesus, and I, and, and I did this many years back, I asked people, why are you not giving yourself up to Jesus Christ? You know, most answers is this, because they are not yet done giving into their own desire. They don't want to give up their own desire in exchange for Jesus Christ. That's why many people up to this day are hesitant to give up their life to Jesus because they want their own freedom. They want their own freedom as if when they give their life to Jesus Christ, they are giving up their freedom as if Jesus imprisons them. Now, the reason for that is because they, they do not have a clear understanding of Jesus. They do not have a clear understanding of the benefits that comes with having Jesus into their life. Their mindset of having Jesus is a mindset of slavery. They have that kind of mindset because they don't understand who truly Jesus is. So that's why they do not want to give up their own desire and take in Jesus into their life. Somehow, being a servant of Jesus is something onerous in nature to them, meaning something that is difficult, something that is oppressively burdensome to them, something that is inconvenient to them in having Jesus in their life, something that is unfair, something that is a waste, of time that is why they do not want to have jesus christ but the reality is it is the opposite it is the opposite now look at what the bible tells us in proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 in the new living translation where there is no understanding of the word of the lord the people do whatever they want to but happy is he who keeps the law. You know, brethren and friends, from time immemorial, people want to do their own thing. People want to be free. They don't want to be ruled. Now, the problem with no laws, the problem with no laws or with no rules, there is chaos and there is anarchy. And when there is chaos and anarchy, there is what we call unrest. Unrest in the community, divisiveness, even in the family, and ultimately, it will give us sorrow. It will give us unhappiness. And that is the price we have to take when we do not live by the laws, by the rules, morality. Now, if you look at the family, if you look at the family until right this very day, and um, I, I scoured the, the internet for, for surveys about families until right this very day, it's still, according to surveys, it's still uh, on the rise is, are the cases of <clears throat> dysfunctional families. Dysfunctional families still on the rise. You know, children explore sex outside marriage, substance indulgences like alcohol, cigarettes, marital unfaithfulness, both of the husband and the wife. Children have no respect for their parents, and parents don't show respect to their children. And these things bring sorrow to the family. Do you think, like me, you and I, parents, do you think this will make you happy? No. This brings sorrow to the family. Now, the children, they might not be remorseful at this very day for their ill behavior to their children or to their parents, but soon, when they reach that point of, 
awakening, they will feel sorry. They will be remorseful. And they wish they had they have never done that. And it's it's <clears throat> so goes through to us parents. But the question is, why is this happening? Why is this happening? The very bottom line answer to that is because there is no God. There is no God in the family. Now, I was talking to someone a couple of days ago uh, at Aborn, I think Aborn Plaza in the Starbucks uh, parking, parking area. Um, we're talking about Jesus Christ. We're sharing a Christian talk, and uh, and then they, a couple of senior ladies approach us, and uh, we're having a wonderful conversation. <clears throat> and then this woman that I was talking to, um, her her testimony was that she saw that, or what could happen, she saw what could happen when God is not living. In the family she testified you know Mike I saw what could happen to a family without God I've witnessed that and he said to me that there is greed there's hatred factions selfish ambitions and everybody everybody in the family wants to tear each other apart and she told me it is like seeing the devil at work you see that's how it is in reality when you do not have god in our in your midst in our midst because we are living galatians chapter 5 19 to 21 and that's one of the consequence when we do not have god now my question would be do you think that that kind of family is a Christian family? No. Do you think that kind of family will be a happy family? I don't think so. There will be unhappiness, there will be sorrow, and there will be unrest in that kind of family. Now, look at this verse again. I want you to look at this verse again. Proverbs 29, verse 18. If you do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to do whatever you want to do, I'm telling you, that is a recipe for disaster. If you want to do what you want to do, that's a recipe for disaster. Why? What is the purpose of the law? What is the purpose? What are the purpose of rules? The main purpose of law, the rule of law, or rules or regulations, is this. They aim to establish what? They aim to establish order order and provide a framework for proper behavior so there can be peace there could be harmony and there could be happiness but without law without rules anarchy chaos so those people who want to do what they want to do again that's a recipe for disaster now again if we look at the verse again the lord said Happy, happy is he who keeps the law. Why? Because you let yourself be guided accordingly by the Lord. So therefore, if you have the Lord in your life, there is what? There is happiness. There is joy. Contrary to unrest, contrary to sorrow. Now, if a family claims to be a Christian family and yet still living in their sins, that is not a Christian family. That is not a Christian family. If I claim to be a Christian and my life, I live my life contrary to what Jesus said, then I'm not a Christian. I am a lying Christian. And I do not embody the true character of a Christian. And I have seen many people, and probably you too as well. I have seen so many people, they stop attending Christian services. Why? Because they were stumbled 
by people who claim to be Christians, but their character tells otherwise. They hold the Bible in one hand, then come Monday, come Tuesday, their life is totally different from what they claim they are. They were cursing, full of hatred, disrespectful, and they exhibit other bad things. <clears throat> now, those who are not attending anymore, the reason for it, because they saw no remorse, no, no remorse at all, no repentance from the so-called Christians. Like they told me, Brother Mike, if that's what Christianity is, then I don't want to be a Christian. If that's what Christianity is, then I don't want to have any part of it. So they stopped attending Christian services. But I told them, I told them that is not what Christianity is all about. That is not what Christianity is all about. They are pretentious Christians and they are not Christians. Now, on the contrary, on the contrary, tons and tons of testimonies of individuals like you and I and families like your families who swore what Jesus did to them. There's a, there are a lot of testimonies out there, including your life. You know, their, their lives were transformed because they now live a Christ-centered life. Now, I want you to try looking at yourselves. Try looking at your, yourself and try to see yourself before. When you do not have Jesus, who were you before? Before without Jesus, and who are you now with Jesus? You know, <clears throat> I do believe in my heart that you and I, we are all a living testament to a godly personal transformation. We were all transformed by Jesus. Is that an amen? Amen. 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 I used to do, when I was making this, I remember myself. I remember myself. When I remembered myself, then and now, and I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look at yourself. Then and now. Look at your family without Jesus and with Jesus. I would rather be here with Jesus than to go back there. As they say, no way, Jose. No way. I will, I will never go back to this place. I have Jesus here. You have Jesus here. Why go back? <clears throat> See, why go back? With Jesus, you know, we are much happier. Amen? Amen. We are much happier. With Jesus, we are more fulfilled. Amen. With Jesus, we have more peace. And Jesus, we have heaven. And with Jesus, we have hope. Amen to all those things. Now, the second consequence of separating ourselves from Jesus, you can do nothing. <clears throat> you can do nothing. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. You can do nothing. I can do nothing. Now, to better understand this, um, <clears throat> we must look at the other verses. Um, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. So we can understand the meaning of this praise by the Lord, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Now in verse 4 again, it tells us to remain in me. Remain in the vine, remain in Jesus, because the vine is the source of life, the source of our happiness. Now, as much as we want to continue living, we cannot do so because we separate ourselves from the vine. We separate ourselves from the source of life. Then in verse 5, the emphatic words of Jesus, 
He said, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Now in verse 6, to understand that phrase, we go to verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch <clears throat> that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, there are actually two things that are, or two collective things, I would say. Two collective things that are happening in, in this verse. And it takes place one after the other. Now, first, it says, like a branch that is thrown and withers. And the other, it says, thrown and burned into the fire. Now, right off the bat, you know that thrown and burned into the fire, it speaks of the judgment. And um, as we move on, we will go to that later on. But the phrase thrown and withers, what does it mean? Uh, let us take first this throne and withers and see the meaning of it in the context of what the statement of the Lord can do nothing means. <clears throat> now the vine and the branch, these are actually a metaphor of Jesus and it is so <clears throat> rich in meaning. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I will try to squeeze all the juice out from it and try to get the meaning and try to, you know, get as much as possible all the meat, all the meat from these illustrations, like we did last week with uh, verse 2 and verse 1. So I hope you will bear with me for a while. Now remember, earlier about the first one, the consequence of bearing no fruit, a life of unhappiness, a life of misery. Now the statement, you can do nothing, it is actually a statement a state of hopelessness. It is a dead end. And if we continue to live in that state, it is a continued state of unhappiness and misery. Now, if we travel our lives in the path with no God, this is, this is where it leads us. It will lead us to unhappiness. It will lead us to misery. It will lead us to dead end and eventually hopelessness. Now, in relation to throne and withers, this is what it means. When you throw something, you throw something that is useless, right? No use to you at all. You, you throw them away. Throne means useless. You know, a, a life without Jesus, it means vanity. It means worthlessness. Now, withers, on the other hand, <clears throat> It means miserable. It means wretched. Now, this is what we are going to end up without Jesus in this life. At the moment, if we continue to live without Jesus, we will be true. Our life will be worthless. We are living a miserable life. We will wither. Miserable life. A wretched life. Now, looking at this, from the perspective of what matters most to a worldly man. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. This is what the Lord says. Let the wise boast of let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. You know, the trifecta of what matters most to a worldly man, wisdom, strength, money, wealth, riches. Many of us, many people, many people put their time, put their effort in these three things instead of prioritizing God. But all of these things, and you know that for sure, have its end. Now, we go and learn from the wise King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Wisdom, strength, and riches, according to the book, they're all vanity. Chasing after the wind, as he said. And we have seen people, 
you know, with their minds, with their wisdom, slowly deteriorating. And we have seen those who used to be in, in great shape, who used to be at their prime, athletes, bodybuilders, who used to have great physique at their prime, but because of illness and because of old age, it had taken away their prime. And even those who are rich, even the, the number one in Forbes magazine, you know, with illness and old age, they cannot prolong their lives and they cannot maintain the youthful appeal. All, according to the great book in Ecclesiastes, all is chasing after the wind. And at the end, what they have, they have hopelessness and they will be miserable. Now, reaching the state of that kind of life without Jesus, you know what they want to, what they wish for? They just wish for peace of mind. They just wish for a happy life, a simple life. But they cannot. They cannot. They cannot have peace of mind. They cannot have happiness. All they have left now are some of these praises. If I could just turn back the hands of time, I will try to change. I wish I was. I wish I have Jesus before. All they have now is just a wish. Now since because these people willfully separated themselves from God, Jesus said they can do nothing. They can do nothing. But for those who remain in Jesus, of course, our boasting is not on those three things. We boast that we know Jesus. We boast that we have him in our lives. And when we reach that same state of life, soon, where our health, our life deteriorates, where our strength is no longer there, we are at peace. You have peace of mind. It's all right. We don't feel miserable. Why? Because you have Jesus. You have Jesus. You are attached to the vine, <clears throat> the source of your life, the source of your happiness. This is why Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. With Jesus Christ, you can do all things. Without Jesus Christ, you can do nothing. <clears throat> if after that state of life of yours that you don't have Jesus Christ, you wanted peace, you will never have peace because you don't have Jesus Christ. You want to be happy, you can never be happy because you don't have Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, you cannot do anything because Jesus, Jesus said, you are not anymore attached in the vine, you can therefore do nothing. But if we are still in the vine, when we reach that point in our life where we are in our old age, when our strength is no longer with us, we are still happy. We can do all things because it is Jesus Christ that gives us strength. And that's why Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. In all situations we are in, we are happy, we are at peace. We can do anything in Jesus because Jesus is our happiness. Jesus is the source of our life and our happiness is not with material things but with Jesus Christ. And with Jesus, you will, he will never fail but those who choose to leave the fold of God and go after these material things, and when these material things 
could not sustain them anymore, they will be miserable. And they can do nothing about it to make their lives happy, to make their lives peaceful because they choose to live in that puddle of mud up to the point in time in their lives. So therefore, you will be thrown away. You will be thrown away. You live a worthless life. You will be thrown away and withers. You will be miserable. And that's the consequence when you detach yourself from Jesus Christ. Now the third consequence, according to John 15 verse 6, is such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Thrown and burn now <clears throat> it means eternal death the second death thrown useless burned in hell so that's what what thrown and burned <clears throat> means so those who up to their dying moment up to that moment in their life still deny Jesus they will suffer the ultimate consequence of eternal punishment in hell. They will be thrown and burned into the fire. Now, after seeing all these consequences, the three consequences, the question should be, is there a remedy for those who backslide? Is there a remedy? Now, the only remedy given to us, again, is to remain in me. Remain in Jesus. Now John 15 verse 7 tells us, <clears throat> if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So you see, there is no other way than to be attached back, to go back to Jesus. He is the source of our happiness, the source of your life. We need to go back to him. You need to go back to him. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23, do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Says the sovereign Lord. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. So if we detach ourselves from the vine, Jesus said, come back. Come back. I want them to turn from their wicked ways, and he wants us to live. Now, the rest of verse 7, a while ago, the second part, it says, Ask <clears throat> whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, this is not something to be taken literal, but rather to be understood in the light of what pleases God. Again, in the light of what pleases God. A true disciple, you know, with this intimate relationship with God, has a wonderful privilege of accessing God's power through prayer in order to accomplish His will for you. Not your own will, but God's will. Now, a true disciple will not ask for anything but what is only proper that will only and only for the glory of God. In John chapter 14, 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, <clears throat> I will do it. You know, asking and imploring in the name of Jesus is only used for their glory. God knows your heart. God knows my heart. God knows our motives. He will do it if it means the glorification of His name. And God's answer will always be according to His time, to His will, and His terms, not ours. So therefore, when we ask anything according to Jesus and God and according 
for the glorification it will be given to you. And that, my dear brethren and friends, is a wonderful uh, benefit that we have because we have now access to God. We can now call God our Father Abba. So we have now that benefit if we continue to live in Christ. Whatever you ask in my name that I will do, or that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, everything that we must ask is for God's glory. And I do believe that as a true disciple of Christ, we will never ask something that is contrary to His will. And if everything that we are going to ask is in accordance with His will, in His time, we just have to wait, and it will be given to us. Now, brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Let us try our very best to remain in the vine, to remain in Jesus, until the day when God calls us home. Now, if we are struggling with our sins, I would say that is good. If we are struggling, why? It only means that we are fighting, that we are resisting, the devil. Continue resisting, continue fighting, and continue to hold on to Jesus. For those, I will say, who are not yet attached to the vine, who are not yet in Jesus, I would like to call your attention to come now to Jesus and accept him and be attached to that vine, to that life giver, that happiness giver. Publicly, you know, declare your submission to Jesus, repent to Jesus, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning, and God bless us all.